So I think we I think we were right here, if I'm correct, right? Because I feel like we kind of started this way, but then we were maybe we kind of ran out of steam. Or we ran out of time, really. Mm. Um, but anyway, so so the idea here was to yeah to use the log score, and so that way you were looking at the overall probability distribution, not just your point prediction. And I kind of feel like I don't 100% kind of understand. So I guess this is just doing the, the column log sum here. Yeah, I, I was not familiar so much with this specific package, but I, I, I feel like I understand that the idea <laughs> is just, yeah, you want to say, um, yeah, what is the, the probability that we would see this given, you know, these parameters? And then you just you sum it to get, you know, kind of your overall picture. Uh, so we also do our leave one out and you can index the scores. Uh, hang on, what, why, why do we log, log the predictions? Why did we log them? Yeah. I, yeah, I think the only reason to do the log is it, it makes the math work out better because the, the numbers are so small. Um, I know that's part of it. Uh, so, yeah, you end up with just a lot of times vanishingly small numbers, uh, but then they end up being negative numbers because you're, you know, taking the log. Um, oh, oh, hang on. It, it's, um, I'm just looking at the image here. It's, um, oh, no, hang on. No, <laughs> I'm in the next section on, uh, what's it, transformations, actually. Can oh, you're in the next section. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 So this is 11. Uh, 11. Which are 11 what? Uh, I think it's 11, 8. Yeah, cross validation section. Okay. Um, so they're doing the average because they have posterior draws. And so I'm not quite sure. Let's find it. <laughs> I, think, I, I think it's probably okay to just say the math yeah. just worked out better. Um, yeah, I, I know that, yeah, because I had taken a, a course on NLP and he was talking about... Yeah. Oh, we always use the log value because you can do the math much better because the numbers are so so tiny. Um, so I, I know that that that's a part of it. Um, and then and then just properties of logs. Uh, you know that you can add them when you're when you're multiplying things together. Then you end up adding the exponents. So it's just, yeah. it just it ends up being kind of a math. Uh, the math works out kind of a thing for like yeah and, and it tends to diminish um uh out like the effects of like extreme values mm, mm. well so you know that that that's another reason for using it i would suppose yeah. it has many uh desirable properties i guess yeah <coughs> mm. yeah <coughs> so after we do that we have what they end up using from here on out the expected log predictive density, ELPD. And they give us a little look at what happens. Um, you know, if you include it in the model, you get pretty good predictive density. <laughs> if you don't, well, it's not so good. And then that makes sense, mm. I suppose. Just, yeah, if you have outliers that you would see that sort of effect. Okay, here's one that I thought was a little bit funny. Uh, so he says, you know, that's the expected log predictive density. The Lu IC is just that same value multiplied by negative two, which is just it just kind of seems a little arbitrary that you multiply it by negative two. I guess it makes uh, the numbers work out. <laughs> but yeah, He's, I don't know. Does that? Do you know the? The whole business of that, I, I guess it's supposed to be like an information criteria. Well, the, criteria. the AIC is plus two. Mm -hmm. Deviant, oh, oh, actually, it's got written here. Deviance is uh, minus two times log score. So yeah. AIC is equivalent to subtracting K from the log score to count for overfitting. It's to do with degrees of freedom. Oh, yeah, actually, that... You know, it, Okay, no, okay. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah, so if it's the 
the value multiplied by negative two, that's because we've, you know, got that same, you know, log uh, prob yeah. the log predictive density. Yeah, so they do talk about it. But he doesn't really say much about AIC. And, and it says, yeah, within the frequentist paradigm. So since we're kind of staying outside the frequentist paradigm here, mm -hmm. we're, we're, <laughs> we're wandering into the wonderful world of Bayesian. Um, although I know there's also a Bayesian information criteria. So I suppose we could have looked at that. Mm. Well, yeah. someone asked me a question, asked a question on the Slack the other day about, um, yeah. about getting the. Um, they said that they'd been asked in a uh, journal article uh, they'd submitted yeah. to provide the um, what's it called the confidence intervals for their predictions, and I they were I asking, yeah. yeah, how to go about it. And it's like, well, actually, you can automatically turn anything that's parametric into Bayesian just by right. doing bootstrapping if you think about it. And then this you just have true. to do the then you have to just do the calculations because yeah. all you're doing is taking the calculations of that prediction and that so you take your predictions you add them all together and then you just create a distribution mm -hmm. that's all you're doing really um it's when you think about it a lot of the bayesian approach is actually stupidly simple it's just mm -hmm. repetitive um but mm -hmm. um that was to do with oh how do you get that information out and i don't computationally think intensive potentially but yeah it's a, the, the the idea is pretty simple um yeah. Anyhow, sorry, I di I uh, digress. Oh, that's cool. It's cool. Uh, yeah, um, you're right. They should have used the. I'm surprised they didn't use the Bayesian criterion. Um, yeah. They talk about it in um, Introduction to Statistical Learning, uh, and it kind of went over my head in there. So I was hoping that. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it yeah. isn't here. Well, it it seems like they're kind of saying that in practice that. They kind of feel like, eh, we'd, we'd rather use, um, you know, what is it they say? We prefer to use cross-validation. This is the book I'm reading. So mm -hmm. it is general and directly interpretable. But for simple models, the two methods give similar answers. So I, I guess it's just that, you know, again, you, they're probably working with more complex models. So, yeah, they want something that's uh, flexible. Mm -hmm. The oh now I think about it, the Bayesian criterion is more used for um, classification because it's to do with the um, the boundary between classes, isn't it? What's oh often yeah. Used for that? Yeah, in the statistical rethinking, they also I'm gonna grab it real quick. <laughs> oh no, where did I put it? <laughs> Don't worry, it's online. <laughs> yeah, it's online. Um, oh, here it is. I always do better with books. <laughs> but but there's a very good information criteria related section. And so they go into all kinds of things. They do, um, I'm going to look up. I had something I wanted to read as well. So they had something called widely applicable information criteria, which seems to be their go-to. And there was another one as well. Yeah. Okay, 190, 191. We got to know all the Bayesian approaches here. Uh, yeah, oh, the deviance information criteria is another one they use. So they say, yeah, it's widely used and easy to compute Bayesian information criterion. Uh, so DIC is a version of AIC that is aware of informative priors. It assumes a multivariate Gaussian, Gaussian, sorry, posterior distribution. So, if any parameter in the posterior is substantially skewed and has effect on prediction, oh well. See, here's what they say in in this book. Then DIC, like AIC, can go horribly wrong. So, <laughs> so there's a tendency for I guess AIC can can prove to be very, uh, you know, unhelpful if if you deviate too far. That's kind of what I'm getting from that. Whereas again, this is a more widely interpretable uh, sort of method to use. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I can't say I've ever really used the AI, AIC that much. Yeah, it seems like more of something you do in class. <laughs> you say, I say this model has lower AIC, therefore it's better. Um, but yeah, you yeah. might not use it so much in, in the world. I don't know. It's a bit like, uh, this is another, another question I had on Slack the other day, um, which was, mm -hmm. um, so someone was asking about, can you make the, uh, what's it called? The Dicky Fuller test. Um, yeah. So the, the uh, what's it called? The adjusted, is it adjusted? Um, augmented, sorry, uh, Dicky Fuller test, where you can apply, get it to be applied to the uh, second order uh, aspects of stationarity. Because yeah. first order is trend, second order is uh, spread um, yeah. variance. But then there's you've got a third order and a, a fourth order, which is to do with skewness and ketosis. Yeah. It's like, well, actually, the question really becomes, is that actually particularly relevant? Um, right. Because if you just visualize it, you know, if you've got something, I don't know. Because it's time series, it tends to, it, it, it's hardly ever doesn't have about that. Uh, but I just, but it, it's kind of like you can apply it to all those other things if you mm -hmm. calculate them separately. So okay. you could just do the Dicky Fuller in time series if you just created a s different columns for the uh, by pulling out the, pulling them out of the mean mm -hmm. in and the distributions. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of like, well, why would you want to? Why would you do it? Yeah, I wasn't clear on, on that. I will say I, I've lost my I've lost track of thought. I'm sorry, I can't remember why I mentioned it. Oh, well, we were just talking about w whether you use the AIC and yeah, and and just that it seems like it's it's something that you learn in school and then oh maybe, yeah that's what you're saying <laughs> yeah yeah so that it's, that's what I meant about the the yeah. uh, the second and third and fourth yeah. order it's like it's kind of all very well but it's actually in reality is you just don't tend to think about them or use them because it doesn't really usually make much of a difference right it, it, uh, yeah i don't think that you're getting a, a big gain from from that yeah anyhow um where, where are we the aic so the aic is yeah. basically don't really use it yeah practice. so he really just kind of brushes it off even quicker he does like one sentence here mm -hmm. um so differences in log score yeah, this is what you tend to to hear. You don't really directly interpret it like say that log score is good or that log score is bad. It's it's more a relative thing. Um, and then they do the this kind of fun exercise. So they say, well, let's let's see what happens if we add noise. Uh, what what effect does it have on our model? And, and so here, they, what they say, the reference point adding a linear predictor that is pure noise and a weak prior should increase log score of the fitted 5.5 at expectation, but should result in an expected decrease of 0.5 in the new log score. So I kind of get what he's saying there. And then they always say like, yeah, you know, you can inflate your R squared by just including all the predictors, but that's not necessarily a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess this is kind of a, uh, yeah, an example of that. So yeah, when the predictors are added, the fit within sample will improve because yeah, it's, you know, fitting to these additional parameters. Um, the ability to fit is desired, but when the models fit using finite data, it will fit partly also to the random noise. So we want to be able to separate which parts of the data allow us to generalize to new data or from a part of the data to the rest of the data, which part is random noise which we should not be able to predict. So, okay, so here's our, we go back to our model with the kids score and the mom in high school and the mom's IQ. And we remember, you know, kind of how that all played out. These are both, you know, important. And we had five pure noise variables. So this is kind of neat what he did. He, he kind of inserted this array inside his data frame, but I guess it, it interpreted it right. That's good. Um, so you have a column that's an array. Uh, and then when you look at the noise, it looks like this. So they're not even their own variables. They're just, you know, columns in the array. So 
with all that being done, they say, well, let's just fit it. Kids score high school IQ noise. And then what happens? So you do get, you know, they, they're noisy. So you get a, like this low estimate, the big error potentially. But then others where it's, it's kind of giving you this sense that maybe they are actually significant when they're not. We know they're not. They're noise. So, okay, so he says Gilman et al. didn't include a seed value. So, okay, sure, uh, simulation might come out different. Um, so what else did he do? Oh, okay, this is where they do the posterior samples to compare. Oh, and then this stat half eye was a new thing I had not seen before, but I could see where that could be kind of handy, where it's kind of like a density plot, but then also your confidence interval. I like that. Yeah, it's kind of cool. Um, so then what, what do we have? So 10.3 is our old model. Looks like this for sigma. Here's our R squared, Bayesian R squared. So yeah, the Bayesian R squared went up with the noise, but actually not so good here. Yeah. And, and then we compare. So yeah, you could do this loop compare. And so this is where they kind of get down to the point. Yeah, even though we added all of them, um, yeah, the difference is negligible. So yeah, it didn't, didn't help us at all. So the difference is less than one point. And they gave kind of a rule of thumb, like if it's less than four, that's essentially, you know, don't worry about it. Um, and, and, you know, other things come in as well, just... Mm. Yeah, the standard error of the difference is important. So, well, and then there it's like, well, yeah, 3.4 versus negative 0.4. So we could get full summaries. I thought there was a mathematical reason why leave one out is not very good. Why it's not um, very good? Yeah, it might be in, uh, might be in introduction to statistical learning. Um, I just remember going over something recently yeah, it might be it's something I did for work, which is basically showed that leave one out was actually mathematically the poorer way of doing um, doing validation. Hmm. Can't remember why. That's interesting. I I wonder myself. Uh, oh, they do. Yeah. Oh well, they talk about a reason when you shouldn't do it. Kind of later on in this chapter. I don't think they went they went in, into the math as deep. That's one to go back and look at ISL, I guess. They remember reading about that in there. I need to get the new uh, edition too. Spring for that. Well, um, it's free online. Um, free online. Oh well, then I just need to <laughs> download it. Yeah. Um, if if you like reading online, I bought the book. Um, I kind of don't, yeah. So, so I might, I might just, uh, yeah, just well, uh, bite the bullet and buy. It. Well, I do, I do two things. I waste uh, trees with books, and then I uh, highlight them with as much ink as possible. Yeah, I highlight and I fold pages, which is probably drives some people crazy. But yeah. Oh, I do that too. I, yeah. I don't do it to books that I read if they're good books, um, yeah. like you know, fiction. If it's like, oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this textbook is just gets absolutely ruined. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, leave one out. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm, I, I, my mind got trapped in this leave one out thing. Um, but it appears to be. Oh, so you. Chapter five. So it's actually later on. So I must have read it somewhere else. Oh. I was having to look up stuff to do with um, cost validation yeah. uh, um, recently. Yeah, I can't remember why I why I read that, but it basically did a proof of showing that leaf one out is useful, but it kind of breaks oh, here down the situation. Oh, from this is from Stan documentation. Oh, that's from Federica. Okay, thanks, Federica. Yeah. So this um, is uh, yeah. Uh, yeah yeah because um. This is always him. Uh, the, it's a package made from uh, he made Gelman. for yeah. yeah for this cross variation. Yes. So. Interesting. There's more. 
Because this live one out is a um, technique used um, not only, so yeah, for this, for this uh, cross validation thing, mm -hmm. but usually for selecting information. So like, yeah. uh, I don't know if, if you know, I, I don't remember correctly, but uh, you like find uh, when you comparing values or parameters or values of uh, parameters, of, mm, uh, hmm. values of the parameters that you like set to uh, the, uh, the decide for one value and then leave the other out. Ah, okay. Something like that. So yeah. very roughly. Yeah. So yeah. And then there is a, yeah. And there is an opposite technique uh, which does exactly the opposite. And this is used even in finance. In finance, you say? Yeah, even in finance. Oh, okay. yes. when, yeah. when you like um, portfolio selections and um, when when you apply a model, basically, mm -hmm. and you need to uh, make some selection and decide for some key uh, values that that are uh, important for for you to choose from. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, very roughly. <laughs> mm. One thing I noticed, I kind of highlighted here too, and, and this is something I remember from the statistical rethinking book. They, um, the methods they were using, they would end up whenever they were comparing multiple models, they would generate these model weights, which he refers to here. So I guess apparently, if you use this, you can, you know, do that. And that way you could get kind of a nice little ensemble uh, where, mm -hmm. you, where, you, where you also, you know, get the estimates of what the model weight should be. So yeah, that's cool. Ensembles are cool. Ensembles are cool. So we're gonna look at, back to my, to my many, many things. Which one is it? Oh, here we go, yep. Uh, so going back to our great uh, model we did. So we fit the kid score versus high school. So that would just, yeah, we left out the mom's IQ. So what does that look like? Um, just add the criterion, you get your LPD, and then you do your compare. Okay, so actually here, then we see that, you know, when we include the mom's IQ, we do get fairly significant uh, help, uh, kind of leading us to think that was a good thing to do. Um, and then this uh, finally answers the question I had when we looked at the model originally, um, I was wondering, you know, does adding the interaction term really help? It, uh, you know, seems to be better, but uh, how much so? Uh, so they go ahead and they add the criterion for that model, the one with the interaction term. And when they do the comparison, it's negligible. So essentially it's, you know, kind of telling us that, or yeah, I, I think it just tells us, oh, well, that didn't really, probably not worth uh, adding that term. Uh, what's terms, the, um, what's yeah. the ELPD uh, diff mean? Uh, uh, just obviously the, diff is difference. Yeah, the difference between the two. So yeah, so, so yeah, so the, the one without the interaction term, it's, you know, this would be considered bad, but just 3.3 .3 is, is a, kind of considered a negligible difference, I think. Is the top one almost acting like a uh, the first factor in a, uh, a contrast coding? I think so, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because it's like saying its difference with itself is zero. Yeah. And then, yeah, that, that, so as you go down, it tells you, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so P Lu, so the parameters, all these other things. Okay, so then we got our um, half I is called, right? Stat half I. Uh, so what are our models? So there's the model with just high school, not very good. We're way over here. Um, and then there's this interesting, yeah, it could go below zero. <laughs> below zero. <laughs> Good. Um, and yeah, so these two models, uh, yeah, again, they seem to, you know, be comparable. This one didn't give us a huge 
gain. Uh, so what is this then? They say delta blue R squared, which I assume is just subtract one from the other. Yep, exactly. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, they say, so between 10.3 and 10.4, eh, very close to zero. And then 10.1 to 10.4, uh, yeah, it seems like you can see a more pronounced effect. Although again, they're, they're very similar. Um, okay, so okay, so here's one. Uh, would leave one out cross validation is unstable. So yeah, they're saying sometimes if you run it, it you'll get a you'll get a warning message kind of saying, well, this is you know, we recommend you try this other method, um, and that's when you switch to kfold. Although I think generally uh, people just use kfold just because it's kind of the standard and computationally also uh, maybe better than doing the leave one out. Well, yeah. in introduction to statistical learning, it definitely says that it's a lot more computationally efficient. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'm reading this out. I've, I found this answer online, um, mm -hmm. which um, I've clearly looked at before because it's uh, it come up in my browser, but basically it's saying uh, cross-validation gives a pessimistically biased estimate to performance mm. because most statistical models will improve if the training set is made larger. This mm. means a k-fold cross-validation estimates um, estimates the performance of a model trained on a data set of blah, whatever size rather than right. 100% of it. So yeah. if you perform cross-validation to estimate performance, then uh, uh, basically, what it's saying is that uh, leave one out is to some extent superior and not as pessimistic. However, Ooh, whilst, yeah, okay. it, uh, whilst leave one out is approximately unbiased, it tends to have a high variance. Uh, um, as the error of the estimate is, com is a combination of the bias and the variance, whether leave one out is better than turn forward depends on both qualities, um, hmm. which, which, is, uh, which is the bias variance trade off. Right, I was going to say that, yeah, the trade-off that we always hear about and think about. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, and, and then it just goes on to say that it's computationally far more expensive. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why tenfold is, it tends to be, um, it tends to be preferred. And I guess um, tenfold so just gives you, yeah, that nice trade-off where you're, you're training on most of the set. But yeah, you still have your your one yeah. tenth. I mean, it certainly makes some sense when you're doing like uh, lo thousands of models. Yeah. Um, because anything that is less than anything that starts getting up to hundreds, which you know, when you're using leave one out, you're probably looking at a lot more folds mm -hmm. or a lot more. Uh, very, yeah. Yeah. So we're going to look at their simulated data now. So 60 cases, 30 predictors, correlation among predictors. So they're pretty highly correlated. Uh, generate fake data. They do the multivariate R norm from mass. So define the data generating beta values and use those 30 predictors to simulate the criterion. Why? So yeah, here's what we decide. Our betas are gonna be negative one, one, two. Rep zero K minus three. Uh, so you just have zero for, for the rest. <laughs> okay. Let's see, so fake data, generate, generate, generate. Um, so let's see, fit the model. Using the N010, that's a pretty flat prior um, mm -hmm. on the coefficients. So what does that look like? Okay, so we check the parameter summary. Uh, yeah, so what from based on this, we would expect right the first few parameters to be important, but then the rest to not be important, I guess. Um, what happens? Yeah, so it's actually, and, but they're also highly correlated. So, you know, it's kind of a lot in the mix here. 
it gets down to a graph at the bottom. Right. So that might be better to, yeah, just kind of get to there. Um, so yeah, they're adding the leave one out estimate. Okay. So, da, 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 da. so yeah, so you can see here, I, I think maybe the, perhaps the reason for doing the highly correlated and all the other stuff was to just try to get a bad result. <laughs> and they did. So they have, yeah, they have good, they have okay, that they have all these uh, bad ones. Um, yeah, so one way to follow the recommendation is to do the k-fold function. So let's see. Or you can add, yeah, do add criterion, k-fold, k-10. So what happens then? So up here, our estimate was negative 147. Based on our tenfold, we get negative 150. So yeah, a comparable result. Um, yeah, it's on the same scale. Our results are similar to those in the text. Okay, regularized horseshoe prior. I can't remember exactly what that is. Do you do you remember what that was? Oh, that's a uh, well. I mean, I've got. I, I imagine the it's just more of a curve, isn't it? Sorry, more of like a, a inverse U. Yeah, yeah, that's what it, it sounded like it would be. Oh, here we go. This is the guy or the person. Regularized horseshoe. Oh, large parameters, small n, which is what we had, right? Oh, uh, right, okay. Yeah. Let's see if we can kind of get through. I feel like he talked about it before. Okay, this is not coming. Okay, so here's your Gaussian. Gaussian prior horseshoe prior. I think it's one of those where it kind of uh, forces things to it's, it's kind of yeah. like regularizing. So yeah, you see things get kind of forced. <laughs> yeah. Towards zero, maybe maybe more strongly. Um, so what is he doing here? So so the way you would specify it, you just say prior is, is a horseshoe for your class B, your betas. Uh, so what happens then? So if we look at what we got as a result, then you, yeah, you see, um, you know, our first couple parameters, again, that, that was how we, you know, generated it. They were actually, you know, used to generate the, the Y values and then the rest not. And you can see they kind of all got, all got flattened out, really. Um, so then we do our K fold again. And then we have our, yeah, ELPD diff. So it looks like, yeah, there's, it's yeah, a little better. Um, so <sighs> here they're doing compare the modes with the coefficient plot focusing on the beta parameters. So, that, so this is like what we were looking at on that other page. So you can see uh, uh, 10, so 1110 is the gray. And then, yeah, that, then the uh, 1111 is the solid black. They've all been kind of shrunk toward the zero. Then you see potentially, it feels like men, yeah, maybe it's just because they're so noisy, right? Because everything is, <laughs> is overlapping zero. Uh, so yeah, it very aggressively pulls the coefficients towards zero. Which is where they belong. Can I ask a question? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure. Uh, can you go a, a little uh, back um, up a bit? Yeah. Uh, this this, this um, uh, in the inside the the plot, no? There is a geom line range, geom point, mm -hmm. and then there is the, this k glimp glimp. Uh, where is this geom, geom line range, position yeah. doge, sides, and k glimpse. k glyph, yeah. Uh, yeah, I have not seen that one in the past. I guess that's this, these things. Mm -hmm. Oops, I got something coming up here. What is, what is this? What? I don't know. We could take a look real quick. I think the size is just the size of the line. 
Yeah. I think that those are just uh, aesthetics. Uh, uh. Um, the I'm not sure where, where it's getting the actual values from. Right. Oh, yeah. It's just getting the value, the actual values from the uh, from the aesthetic mapping at the top. And then it's using oh the right here y min and and estimate yeah. y min and x uh, y min and y max are the lines, and then he's used the dodge to split them between each other, right? And then he specified mm -hmm. uh, where is it? Oh, okay, dodge. yeah. Dodge I... position is how far there is between the two of them. Okay, sorry, that's a good tip. Yeah, but this part, what, what, uh, what uh, key glyph equals path? Um, I think maybe this is just talking about what how they display it here. I don't know. Oh, let's maybe, see. yes, let's see. It's just, um. What is it called? It was called line path? Line range. Line range. Yeah, that's a line range, but that's an option that goes inside. It's one uh, word. Yeah. Oh, line okay. range. Uh, yeah. Geom line range, sorry, to be precise. Geom. We also have crossbars. Ah, it's not go. very common. Uh, it's not very common, so I don't use it very frequently. Hmm. So Key maybe glyph just must be just a, a general GG plot thing. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna guess. Let's let's look and see real quick. So identify the path. What? Uh... I'm probably doing this wrong. Oh, key glyph GG plot. Oh, that's right. Okay, so it is to do with the uh, legends. Oh, that's okay. Oh, that's the legend. Oh, uh, so draw a key point range. Mm -hmm. Yeah, key glyph. Oh, so like, yeah, if you have a time series and you uh -huh. want to do classic time series, you would just say, uh -huh. oh, that, ooh, uh -huh. I feel like I should use this more. Oh, well. <laughs> that's neat. Yeah, Sorry, no, key that's why, because... Yeah, I even use it. Yeah, yeah. Key glyph, all, all it's doing is yes, tell you yes. how it looks in your oh, legend. Oh, okay, yeah. I see. So, yeah, like, the yeah. time series, you got your class. It, yeah. Oh, it's trends continue. Mm -hmm. That's quite nice. That is good. That's a nice uh, spotting. So, yeah. you did the, so, you did the part. That's what part? Cool. So, the, the one that we saw, apparently, that's for. Yeah, so that's this little dot in the middle of the line. So that's uh -huh. what that path is. Oh, that's nice. I'm going to uh, cut and paste this to my great uh, <laughs> samples. I see. It's yeah. interesting. So you find it. Uh, you always learn something new. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So that was interesting. So, okay, so the thing I always wonder, uh, everyone, with, um, you know, with the Bayesian stuff, so we talked about the horseshoe prior. So we kind of we kind of knew the answer in the back of the book was that most of these were supposed to be very small. So we used a very strict prior, but I'm just kind of wondering, you know, <laughs> in practice, when, you know, when would you do that? Would you do that because you felt you know, may, maybe you maybe you would look at the data and say, "Oh, they are highly correlated." So maybe I need to. Yeah, I don't know. Any any thoughts on that? Or as soon as I saw anything that's highly correlated, I would do do a time mm -hmm. dimensionality reduction. D dimensionality reduction. Yeah, I mean that's uh, yeah. certainly another option it's, at your disposal. Well, there's two things, aren't yeah. there? You, you, you'd probably go for a lasso in order to yeah. cut down the cut things down if you thought there were too many things that were. Uh, the same and yeah. you uh, a dimensionality reduction if uh, you you felt like they could be combined because mm. you can do both you could do both um, you could you could say oh I want to do a I want to reduce down these particular uh, predictors 
and mm -hmm. this set predictors that I have all come under the set of oh I need to have these in my data so I'll I'll reduce them down to simple dimensions mm -hmm. um, or that that is how I tend to think of it yeah I mean I feel like in practice that's probably um, I mean, it certainly makes a lot of sense to do um, I just I'm just trying to get get into the Bayesian way of thinking I guess I yeah i think what they're trying to show here is that if you're doing it with the, because they haven't used any practical data here they've just used contrived examples yeah this is exactly that's what i'm saying so this is um, kind of a, an invented example <laughs> so yeah so, yeah so what they're saying is oh well in this particular case what you can do is um you can do this uh, what's it what's it called the horseshoe horseshoe yeah, regularized uh, horseshoe prior. Yeah, regularized horseshoe. But if you think about it, um, I mean, a lasso is a, a was it L two penalization or is it L one? I can't remember. Uh, I think the lasso one. is L L one because the way I remember is the lasso has the weird diamond shape. It's not like a lasso. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, and then I think the other one's L two. Yeah, they work from different positions, don't they? Right. One comes from the back, one comes from the front. Yeah. Um, and that's how they end up with um, working out what the maximal, uh, what the best fit is. Um, yeah. I mean, is it as simple as saying, you know, if I'm fitting a model and, you know, I, I feel like regularization is something that would benefit me <laughs> that I would use that kind of like you would do, do with a you know lasso model maybe that's it I don't know I mean if if you if if you're working in a system that already exists with a set of mm -hmm. data that's already been established yeah you might have like for instance um an example is when when when, I, when, you, when you're doing time series you'll often build up a set of lags right mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah, that will need to be consistent <laughs> across most of your database so that you can justify that mm -hmm. to your clients. Yeah, and yet yeah. not all of it's important. So what you'll do is you'll put penalization in, in order to mm -hmm. um, in order to restrict the importance of different features in the um, in the prediction predictive model. Mm -hmm. um, so I often put like a penalization of like say 0 0.1 in. Um, oh, okay. You know, mm -hmm. which is quite conservative or quite restrictive. Um, mm, mm. people prefer to go somewhere between 0 0.1 and 0, uh, uh, 0 0.1 and 0 0.01. Um, mm, okay. But I mean, I suppose it's not too dissimilar from that if you think about it. And that, therefore, if you've got regressors in that you're not moving out, then you might just want to do the penalization. I see. And that's how I'm thinking about it based on, you know, this conversation. <laughs> makes sense, I think, yeah. I, and I guess part of it, yeah, just the whole kind of focus of this chapter has been comparing models. So, I mean, you can get a sense of what is working better. <laughs> so, I mean, you could try different things and, you know, pick the, pick the one that works best. Yeah, I mean, it, it is saying adding this extra, all these extra terms mm -hmm. <laughs> works, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, shall we move on to the next one? We can, um, but honestly, I have a call coming up in like five minutes, so okay, um, we might want to save it for next time if that's cool with everyone. Yeah, I mean, it's cool with me. Uh, I mean, it is. It's pretty coherent, straightforward chapter in a way. It's all about um, what's it? Um, transformation. Transformations, yeah. And regardless of whether you're doing Bayesian or not, understanding transformations is really, really good, useful. Yeah, it's a good chapter. Um, we could probably get through most of it next time, I, I would guess. Yeah, I, th I, I think so. Um, That's some really beautiful have... plots, too, toward the end. Yeah, so we can go over those and how those were generated. I was just thinking that, yeah. yeah. Oh, and then after that chapter, we get to go into the world of generalized linear models. So that's exciting. All right. Take the next Sweet. step. Okay, cool. Well, I'm glad we got to the end of the... Uh end of that chapter on uh yeah, yeah it's re it's really nice actually seeing the stuff on the leave one out and the cross validation stuff yeah um
obviously, like they've left, they've done the leave one out stuff because, as we've said before, it's probably actually in some ways superior. Yeah. But in other ways, it actually works out as being a worse situation, really, for the cross validation. Right. Um, yeah. But then they're probably not thinking about data scientists, are they? They're thinking about they're thinking like uh, academics with a certain number of papers and the smaller data sets. Right. Yeah, I think, yeah, they're coming at it from that angle where a lot of times they don't have as much data. So, yeah, how, how do you deal with that situation? Mm. Yeah. But it's good, yeah. To, good, good to see things from that angle, I think. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I've originally come from academia and I think yeah. I found, found different ways of thinking between that and private sector as being really beneficial to understanding statistics in general. I think it would be advantageous. Yeah. Definitely. Right. Shall we? Um, shall we leave it there then? Um, um, yeah, I'm good. Uh, I think that's a nice stopping point. Certainly, uh, end of the chapter. So yeah, um, pick it up next time. Yeah. Cool. Brilliant. Um, in, in that case, then uh, I'll speak. Cool. Oh, um, what was it? Uh, sorry, quickly because you've only got four minutes. Um, John said that next week is. I saw. Sometimes it's creeping over, but I'm quite happy to still do it next week. I, I just need, we just need to make sure that we um, uh, get it um, connected in the right way. Just get our right, time. Right, right. So he, your, t- your time doesn't change, but my time does. Okay. Um, yeah, and, I think that's where he was coming from. Yeah, because we change our times. Well, actually, we change our times this weekend. No, no, you're right. We change, yeah, we... You guys change your times, and then we change our times the following week. Yeah. It's just something stupid. <laughs> yeah, it's a thing we do. But anyway, yeah. So it would stay the yeah, same time in America. Thing. Is it yeah. the same with you, Frederica? Yours t- changes as well next week? Yes, yes. We, okay. we have a one-hour difference, but we change as well. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, in that case, I'm happy to, um, I'm happy to still do next week if, um, if you guys want to. Yeah, I feel like I feel like I should be able to. Um, we can just um, I'll I'll pop into yeah. the Slack uh, sometime because this is my kind of my mid early afternoon. So I'll I'll just check and and maybe ping you guys or or something and just kind of see. Yeah, what what time should we be? <laughs> yeah. So. Okay. Brilliant. Oh, uh, looks like your meeting started. Um, I'll let you both go. Thanks. Uh, thanks again, Ooh, guys. Okay. Yeah. No problem. It's good talking to y'all. See you soon. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.